Hello everyone, if you are looking for an overview of liver diseases for step one and two, then this is the episode for you. Please enjoy. Hey future doctors, thanks for tuning in to Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Rebecca Shanick. I'm a rising fourth year medical student at Western UConn, and I'm going to be your host today. I'm a little bit biased when I say that the liver is the best organ. It's significant in detoxification, it's the largest internal organ for those who have normal anatomy, and it's one of the few organs that can regenerate. When I say liver disease, many people automatically associate this with alcohol, but as we will discuss today, there are so many different causes. Do you ever look at elevated liver function tests and wonder, what does this even mean or how can I interpret this? Or maybe your patient looks a little jaundice and you want to know why. Today, we're going to have a comprehensive discussion on liver disease, including topics of hepatitis, fatty liver disease, autoimmune conditions, and primary liver cancer. I'll try to keep it short and sweet, asking questions in between the content so you can reflect and retain information. But please feel free to pause if you need to come back to this and understand it in smaller pieces. Let's get started. What is the difference between cirrhosis and fibrosis? Fibrosis is a thickening or scarring. This can happen anywhere. And it's graded in the liver from levels zero to four. When it's level four, we consider that to be cirrhosis. And it's causing limited functioning of our hepatocytes. What are some key features of cirrhosis that you can think of? If you answered hepatosplenomegaly, portal hypertension, that would be correct. Some other factors of decompensated cirrhosis include edema, ascites. Associated with ascites would be spontaneous uh, bacterial peritonitis. Also jaundice, spider angiomas, caput medusae, hepatic encephalopathy, and hepatorenal syndrome. Individuals may also experience esophageal varices. These can be very dangerous when they rupture. And so what kind of screening tests should we do for our cirrhotic patients? If you answered endoscopy, you would be correct. We should do this in an interval, depending on if varices are present or if banding is performed because of the concern for rupture. What labs do you wanna order for your patient who you're concerned about has fibrosis or cirrhosis? Well, let's just do a full panel. So we're gonna see hyperbilirubinemia, thrombocytopenia, elevated INR, hypoalbuminemia, and transaminitis. Might not be present in all of the patients, but you can kind of start to think about Um, some of the pathophysiology that influences these lab findings. We also do something called the child pew scoring, and it's graded A through C. A would be compensated, C would be decompensated, and have a lower life expectancy. We also use the MELD scoring system, which is really helpful for determining um, if someone is eligible for certain treatments or transplant, and this helps rank patients on the transplant list. It also um, is used to calculate the mortality risk in the next three months. So very useful. Uh, The diagnostic gold standard test, does anyone know it? If you thought liver biopsy, you would be right. So to treat cirrhosis, we need to treat the underlying cause of the disease. So, what are the different types of viral hepatitis? If you remember A through E, you would be right. Hepatitis A and hepatitis E are spread the same way. Do you remember what that is? If you thought fecal oral, that's correct. It's often due to contaminated food and water sources. So you can treat hepatitis A with supportive care, and there's also a vaccination that's available. We'll come back to hepatitis B because it's a little bit more complicated. 
Hepatitis C is transmitted via the blood, commonly among drug use, and prior to 1992 due to blood transfusions. It's an RNA virus, and there's no vaccine, unfortunately, but there's been new treatments in the last 20 years that are very effective. This can become a chronic disease if left untreated. Hepatitis D is a defective RNA virus, and it can only technically infect you if you have hepatitis B. Hepatitis E, as I explained earlier, is fecal oral contamination. And who is like at most at risk for developing Hep E? If you thought pregnant patients, then you would be correct uh, because they're more at risk for fetal loss, acute liver failure, and higher mortality. We also treat this with supportive care. And hepatitis is a reportable disease. So if you remember what that means, um, it's similar to other conditions that you have to report to the health department and they will track it to make sure that there's no outbreak. So going back to hepatitis B, I feel like every time I studied this in med school, I was having to relearn it. So let's try to make it a little bit more easy to understand. It spread uh, via birth or sexual contact. It's a DNA virus. So let's try to interpret the labs. Hepatitis B surface antigen shows that there's a active infection. So this will be positive in acute and chronic infections. Anti-hepatitis B core, which is IgM and IgG, What's going to be present in an acute? If you thought IgM, you would be right. What about for chronic infection? It's IgG. Okay, anti-hepatitis B surface. This would be positive in someone who has recovered and is immune or has been vaccinated. All right, the vaccine series is usually given, at least in the US, uh, when you're a baby. Uh, the first dose being within 24 hours of birth. And then after the first dose, and then six months after the first dose. This can become a chronic issue if left untreated. And it's managed with anti, uh, antivirals, and they often monitor the DNA viral load just to make sure that there's no detectability. Let's move on to fatty liver disease. What do you know about this condition? Because you're going to see a lot of patients with this issue, especially if you go into primary care. It's very prevalent, and it's a rising issue that's related to cirrhosis and even liver cancer. It's related to metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and patients who have dyslipidemia or history of type 2 diabetes. Fat deposition in the liver is not due to alcohol. That's why it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Fat deposition in the liver not due to alcohol with signs of inflammation and hepatocyte damage is called NASH. So review your biochem of lipid metabolism in the liver for a better understanding this would be a good time to go back to that chart. What do you think that we can do to prevent fatty liver disease? If you thought manage triglycerides and maintain a healthy weight, that would be right. For healthy weight, we use BMI as a, a good marker, as well as waist to hip ratio. In fatty liver disease, you might see ALT greater than AST. This is not always the case, but could be indicative of this condition. There will have elevated triglycerides, likely. And on imaging, you can do a right upper quadrant ultrasound, uh, something called a fibro scan. It evaluates fibrosis um, based off of the density, as well as a CT of the abdomen or MR elastography. 
Okay, moving on to liver cancer, also called hepatocellular carcinoma. People who have cirrhosis are at higher risk of developing this. Although, people who have what virus can be at high risk no matter what stage of fibrosis are they? If you thought hepatitis B, you would be right. While other labs might not be altered, something that's most indicative is an elevated AFP. It's not specific to the liver, and you might recall learning this in other organ systems, so don't automatically think elevated AFP, liver cancer. Try to um, look at the whole clinical, clinical picture. You diagnose this with imaging and liver biopsy, and the treatment can be surveillance, partial hep hepatectomy, liver transplant, chemo, tumor ablation. Obviously, this would be done at a center that is specialized for liver cancer. Alcoholic hepatitis, this is probably something that you're often gonna see as well. This could be chronic use versus acute alcoholic hepatitis. So per the CDC, how much is too much alcohol in one sitting? For women, that's more than four drinks on one occasion. And for men, it's more than five in one occasion. Per week, it's eight drinks per women and 15 drinks per men. People who have alcoholic hepatitis might have an elevated GGT. Also, uh, classically, we see the AST greater than two times the ALT. Again, this doesn't have to be perfect, but it might be something that you notice. How would you um, go about treating this person? If you thought counseling and motivational interviewing to reduce alcohol consumption, as well as um, possible medications that you can give for alcohol cessation and alcohol withdrawal, you would be right. Something also to consider would be vitamin supplementation, just because of the association with thiamine deficiency in these patients. I wanna bring up something else next. It's called drug-induced liver injury. This is something also to keep an eye on, especially when you're prescribing medications and you wanna make sure that there's no liver impairment if especially it's being metabolized through the liver. So what's a big cause that you often hear about of drug-induced liver injury? If you thought acetaminophen, you would be right, but if you thought a multitude of other medications, you would probably also be right because you should know your hepatotoxic drugs, especially those that are metabolized through CYP450. So this would be a good time to review that. The labs that you should um, evaluate for a drug-induced liver injury, order a CMP, which includes your liver function test, ALT, AST, GGT, ALP, and total billy. You may see that an ALT and AST are greater than two to three, or sorry, three to five um, times the upper limit. Okay, what do you know about hemochromatosis? Iron is depositing in the liver and could be in other areas such as heart or pancreas. It can be hereditary and depending on which type, could be autosomal dominant or recessive. This increases someone's risk of getting hepatocellular carcinoma. They might have elevated LFTs. And what else might be elevated? If you thought ferritin or um, iron to transferrin ratio, you would be right. Treat this with a phlebotomy, supportive care, Wilson's disease, what do you know about this? They might have copper deposits in their liver as well as their brain and eyes. A healthy liver produces bile, which is stored where? In the gallbladder, which removes copper excess. So on labs, you might see elevated copper, AST, and ALT. You can also evaluate using a 24-hour urine and liver biopsy. 
Treat those using medications that act as chelating agents that bind and remove copper from the body. All right, what is Gilbert syndrome or Gilbert syndrome, depending on how you pronounce it? Okay, if you said that they have an elevated unconjugated or indirect bilirubin and a normal conjugated bilirubin or direct bilirubin, you would be correct. The elevated total bilirubin will be impacted due to the elevated indirect bilirubin. They'll have a normal liver function panel uh, based off of AST, ALT. And there's no treatment that is required. Okay, what's the difference between PBC and PSC? So, as a reminder, the acronyms are primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. I feel like this is something that a lot of medical students get mixed up, and I want to make sure that we distinguish the two. They might have similar symptoms, fatigue, pruritus, jaundice, but the demographics are, uh, are different. Who is more likely to have PBC, females or males? It is females. Versus PSC is more likely males. So labs and imaging. For PBC, you want to do AMA, ALP, ALT, AST. For PSC, you may notice a beaded appearance on cholangiography. Remember that. <laughs> All right, the causes of each of these conditions. Do you know this? For PBC, it's granulomatous inflammation, which destroys the small intrahepatic bile ducts. For PSC, it's fibrosis that affects and destroys the medium to large extrahepatic ducts and intrahepatic bile ducts. What is associated with each of these conditions? Well, for PSC, ulcerative colitis is associated with it. For PBC, other autoimmune conditions may be present. The outcome for both, however, can lead to cirrhosis. So this is why they're significant. All right, let's keep going. What is autoimmune hepatitis? This is a chronic inflammation of the liver, more likely in females. The AST, ALT, and GGT are very elevated. And you can evaluate an ASMA with or without ANA or the anti-LMK, anti-LC. Treat this with steroids. Okay, friends, I know that we just studied a lot and there was a lot of information. If you need to go back and review it, I want to um, wrap up by saying I know we discussed liver disease covered a lot of things. We're going to do a rapid review using word association. So this could be helpful on those multiple choice type exams that we all take. If you think copper accumulation, which disease is associated with that? You're correct, Wilson's disease. If you think iron accumulation in the liver, what are you thinking? Hemochromatosis. If I say someone has hepatitis D virus, D as in dog, which virus do they also likely have? Hepatitis B. If I say someone has an elevated AFP and some sort of liver diagnosis, you're probably going to have a high suspicion for what condition? Hepatocellular carcinoma. If someone has elevated triglycerides and liver disease, they probably have NAFLD or NASH. 
If someone has elevated unconjugated, which is the indirect bilirubin, they probably have Gilbert disease. Okay, thank you so much for listening. If you're preparing for step or level one, you've got this. If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, visit the website at spoonfulofsugar.org and post them under the link for this episode. Good luck with studying. Spoonful of Sugar is always here to help the medicine go down. It was great studying with you all tonight.